talk about science. So, science in the Bible. Um, before, the other science that we've talked about before was in Genesis chapter 1 and creation. And so, we're going to take a little bit different avenue and science in the Bible. The first two points that I have are conceptual facts. In other words, we're going to talk about different types of sciences and relate them back to the Bible. And then the third point that I have is a specific fact that comes from the Bible. Uh, in other words, we talked in Sunday morning Bible class about specific science facts that the Bible knew before science knew. And so we'll talk about one of those in a little bit more detail. And then if we have any more time permitting, one of our reference cards talks about science. And so we'll go into some of those facts. So, I did get the board out in case I decide to draw some things, and my students know that I'm not a very good artist, so uh, I will try to do my best if I need to illustrate a point. Uh, but, one of the things that is taught in biology is you are what you eat. And if we're ever trying to lose weight, this is a very good point because we have to take in certain nutrients and we take in fats, we take in carbohydrates, which is like breads, pastas, things like that. And a lot of people when they're trying to lose weight, they think, well, I don't want to take in fats because fats are bad and that's what everybody tells us, fats are bad. But we need fats. Um, again, we are what we need. Um, so before we get too deep into that, let's look at a little bit of what our ecosystem is. In other words, animals and plants around us because we are part of that in a sense. Um, so we have what's called an energy pyramid. And I'm not gonna go too deep into this. Some of you guys probably remember this from your own high school science classes. But all of our plants are down here at the bottom. And notice that they get a bigger bar because we have a lot more plants than we do anything else. And then right above that is what eats the, plant, eats the plants. So we have, for example, rabbits and what we were talking about before, deer. So these are the things that eat those. And what they say is only about 10% of the energy moves on. So again, we are what we eat. So the rabbits and the deer, all that energy that they get from the plants moves on to them. Okay, we are what we eat. And then we look at the things that eat the rabbits and the deers. Sorry, Lydia, they would eat rabbits and deer. Um, and so we've got like wolves, and even we can put humans in here, but humans are going to be higher up. And so even only 10% of this energy moves on. Okay. So I'm, again, I'm not going to get too technical on that, but uh, so we become part of the plants, we become part of the rabbits and deer because we eat all that. We are what we eat. So as like I was saying, the nutrients even that we take in becomes part of us. And some people don't want to eat fats, but our cells in our body have a layer around the outside called a phospholipid, phospholipid bilayer, and lipids are simply fats, and so we have to have those in order to make our cells, and our cells do all of the functions in our body. They help us breathe, they help us to um, make our DNA, they help clone ourselves to make new cells skin cells die, and all of that. So we need all the nutrients that we take in, fats and bones. So we are what we eat. Now, what does this have to do with the Bible? Well, let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 47 through 46 is what we're going to be reading. And we'll get some spiritual context for we are what we eat. We're going to be looking at 47 through 64. Now I'm going to break this up so we don't all have to, or so one person doesn't have to read all this. So, John 6, 47 through 64. 
So, Steve, if you would get 47 through 49 for us, please. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. The Father takes the man and the world of man. And after, you're in chapter 6 of John? Yeah. Oh, okay. 47 through 49? Oh, okay. I have to Okay. And Annette, could you get verses 50 through 51? This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man might be fed after that. And any other religion which come down from heaven, any other religion which come down from heaven, any other religion which come down from heaven, Okay, so before we move on, so Jesus says that there he is the bread of life. And he talks first of all in verse 49 that there was manna that they ate in the wilderness. And this was manna that came from heaven. God provided for them, the Israelites, when they were in the wilderness. And if we eat of this bread, we'll die because it's physical bread. And he's talking about spiritual bread. And the spiritual bread that we need to eat of is his flesh. And he's not talking literally eating of his flesh. Okay. Uh, Renata, could you get verses 52 through 56, please? The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Thank you. And so He's saying that his his flesh is meat and his blood is drink. What does this remind us of? The Lord's Supper, right? Because he instituted the Lord's Supper with the bread and saying, this is my body. And the cup saying, this is my blood. Right? And so that's what he is talking about here in the spiritual sense not literally his flesh and not literally his blood and I forgot your name Melvin 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 yes okay Uh, would you be able to read 57 and 58 please and the living father sent me and I live because of the father so he ought to uh, feed me on him will live the faith. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not your father ate the, uh, ate the man and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Okay. Thank you. And so if we eat of Jesus' flesh and drink of his blood, we'll be able to live forever. Now there's some context here need to pick up on not just anybody who eats of that flesh there we have to obey but if we eat of that flesh and drink of that blood we can live forever sarah would you be able to get 59 and 60 please these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in capernaum many therefore of his disciples when they heard this said this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Okay. Yeah. So he's. There are some that are having difficulty understanding. And Joseph, would you get the last four verses here, sixty-one through sixty-four, of John six? Yeah. 
so the Son of Man that sent out where he was before. It is the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth not with the word. Words that I speak unto you today are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray them. The spirit quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So what does this have to do with we are what we eat? Let's go to John chapter 1 now. He's telling us that if we eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, we'll be able to live forever. And he says the words are life. The words are spirit. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Greek word here for word is logos. Verse 2, the same was in the beginning with God. If we skip down to verse 14, and the word, again, capital W, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is the word? Jesus. And logos is the spoken word. And so if we eat of the spoken word, in other words, if we study God's word spiritually, eat of that flesh, we'll live forever. If we study it, and not just only study it, which we'll look at another passage here when we get to the second point, but not only study it, but do what with it? Obey it. Not just read it and look at it, but we also obey it. So we are what we eat. We become that flesh in a sense because we are the children of God when we obey it. We become the children of God. We were already made in his image, but we come back to him when we are obedient to him. And the only way that we can be obedient to him is if we truly eat of his flesh. Right? So we are what we eat. Does that make sense? Okay. So the next point that I want to look at, let's erase this. And again, I'm not going to get too deep into the science, but we heard of carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay. Carbon monoxide poisoning probably one of the ways that we don't have to get too gory into it is accomplished by when a house catches on fire and we wake up to that fire. Uh, there's no fire in your room, but there's smoke in your room. And we hear the smoke detector go off. We sit up in alarm because it scares us. And there's carbon monoxide poisoning. It's a um, clear gas. Uh, there's no color to it. There's no smell to it, but you sit right up into it. And you're scared, so you take a deep breath when you sit up, and you just breathe in all that carbon monoxide gas. Well, this is what happens. Our red blood cells are called biconcave, and the reason that they are is because the nucleus goes out of the cell as it gets older, it matures. And on the cell, there's these little uh, proteins called hemoglobin. And that hemoglobin has binding sites for normally oxygen. And all of us know that we breathe oxygen, right? Well, we breathe the air around us and oxygen is in that air. We've talked about that before when we talked about creation. There's argon and nitrogen and but it has binding sites for oxygen, okay? Well, oxygen is very similar to carbon, if I can spell correctly, carbon monoxide. And there's actually just one O, but um, I'm doing that for effect, okay? Um, but no 
notice one oxygen when this one is written out in formula you actually have two oxygens but in chemical form those two are very similar okay trying to wait oh, it's going to. so the binding sites on the that red blood cell for the hemoglobin look alike for these two and so when you breathe in the carbon monoxide the red blood cell and the hemoglobin can't tell the difference and so what happens is the carbon monoxide starts to bind to all of the hemoglobin and it takes up all of the oxygen binding sites and now the oxygen can get onto your red blood cells. And the reason this is important is because when you breathe in oxygen into your lungs, the red blood cells take that oxygen to all your cells so that your cells can go and do its processes. Well, if it takes all of the carbon monoxide onto your cells instead of the oxygen, now you're taking carbon monoxide to your cells instead of oxygen. And efficient, um, what you're doing instead is suffocating from the inside out because you're not getting oxygen to your cells. Okay? So what this is, is a poison. Okay? So you're poisoning yourself in a sense. You're not doing it on purpose. It's happening naturally. Now, there are some people that will do this as a suicide form, but like I said, we're not trying to get morbid with this. It can happen naturally. Um, so, we also have a process in science that fits into this. This is kind of what engrafting, and most of us know about the um, engrafting process with plants in the vines of grapes. And the way that this happens is you take the stem of one of the plants and you cut it down the middle and you take the other one and you put it inside that part that you just split and then you take it together. And it takes about three to four weeks to get sprouts off of your engrafting. Okay. And so that takes a little bit of some time. Well, this is a good process. And we apply this spiritually. Let's turn over to James chapter 19. chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 1. So here we have, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay? Swift to hear. This process right here of carbon monoxide poisoning is very quick. It doesn't take very much time at all. But the engrafting process is slow. It takes time. Verse 20, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is, in it, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straighteth in straight way, forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So, if we are swift to hear, we're taking in poison. But if we are slow to speak, slow to wrath, we are going through that engrafting process because it takes more time. So now let's look over at Matthew chapter 4. And this one we know of Jesus' temptation. Matthew chapter 4, and this is verses 1 through 11. And Steve, could you get verses 1 through 4 for us, please? Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. 
every living thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat the flesh with the light, as it in the blood. Surely you shall, uh, your uh, life blood will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast. I will require it and from the hand of man, from the hand of every man, brother, will I require life of man. Thank you. Uh, so, here we see that the blood or the life is in the blood verse 4 and he's telling them not to eat of the flesh while it has blood in it so specifically if they were going to eat of the flesh it needed to be all the blood needed to be cooked out of it and we see that later in the books of the law of Leviticus and Deuteronomy when the priests were going to cook of the sacrifices it had to all be cooked there were certain blood sacrifices, but any time that there was to be a burnt offering, think of what it's called, burnt offering, it had to all be cooked out, no blood. They were not to eat of the blood. And the reason is, we see in verse 5, that the blood was going, if blood was going to be shed, it's going to be required of man. And we'll look at verse 6 here in just a second. But And there were was, there was several discoveries later by man, but I'm going to point a few out here. 1628 was when it was discovered that blood pumped through the body, specifically by the heart. And if we don't have blood pumping through the heart, we don't have blood. So, uh, 1900 was when Carl Landsteiner discovered the three blood groups, A, B, and O. And two years later, in 1902, two of his students discovered the AB blood. Some of you might know your blood types. My students don't ever know their blood types because they don't talk to their parents or their parents don't tell them. And I don't do blood typing in my class because that leads to a lot of legal issues or, oh no, I'm adopted. And those kind of things. And I don't get into all that. So, you did it in college? Yeah, I had to do it in college with uh, medical lab. I would love to do it, but nowadays with everything that goes on, I, I mean, I'm certified still, so I could do the blood drawing, but I'm not going to do all that. Uh, so verse 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man, shall his blood be shed? And notice the ending of that, the reason why. For in the image of God, this is the reason why murder is a sin. Now, killing is a sin, but notice the Bible gives a distinction between murder and killing. In the Old Testament, we have sanctuary cities for those who killed but didn't commit murder. There was a distinction between killing and murder. If you accidentally killed somebody, you had a refuge place where you could go. There is a distinction. Murder is what Cain did to Abel. He senselessly killed his own brother. He took his blood. Yeah, that's what we call it. Manslaughter. Manslaughter, right. The war thing. The war thing. That would be killing. It's different than murder. Now, there is murder in war. Right. There is different a difference there. That's like self-defense. You protect yourself and others. Right. There, we do have conscientious objectors, which is usually religious people. So we don't hold them accountable legally. They are allowed to get out of war and for the right reasons, obviously. It doesn't go, that way it doesn't go against their conscience. Um, but there is a distinction. Now, it's going to come down to each individual Christian as to what to do with that. I support the military and what they do, but now as myself, I don't know that I can do that. Um, I did go and I enlisted in the Navy, but that was before I opened the gospel. But I fully support the military because we
or applying it to archaeological dig sites? Sure. Because most of our archaeological dig sites, like from Egypt or from the Middle East or from anywhere in Europe, these things work because they're only a few hundred years old, a few thousand years old. They're going to work. Uh, now, if they're three to four thousand years old, we're pushing it a little bit and there's going to be a plus or minus on there because now we're getting closer to being off. questions on that?
Father in heaven, I almost missed it, but I don't know how we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come here this evening. So that I want to thank you for all the blessings that you give us. The biggest blessing that you give us is when you want to be one of the only begotten Son of our Lord and Savior. song is 643. 643 is the first section of fourth verse. Where we are from, let's fill you our tempest thoughts. When you are discouraging Whether you're 
brand new teacher to teaching or just a new teacher to the district. They do this for all the new teachers. And I wasn't really doing anything this morning, so I decided I would go sit with the new teachers, and partly because I'm a mentor teacher to one of the new science teachers. And it's good to sit in on these things because you can pick up things that you hadn't heard in a while. You can learn new things um, or get your mind refreshed on some things that you may have forgotten. And one of the things that they said this morning was to have or show grace to your students, especially those problem children. In other words, when you're disciplining, disciplining these problem children, show grace to them. And show grace to yourself. Because, you know, as we know, sometimes we make mistakes and we beat ourselves up. We've talked about that kind of before sometimes. But um, it, it got me thinking and it reminded me that I haven't always handled situations very well in the classroom. I could always do a little bit better. But God shows us grace. And God showed grace when he gave us the plan of salvation. When he sent his son. And it was by his grace that he sent Jesus. But we have to access that grace through obedience. If you would turn to Hebrews chapter 5. And as teachers and students, we have to realize that our students have to access a teacher's grace as well. And that's, that's where they talk about teachers making relationships with the students. And the way that students access that grace is by obedience to the teacher and doing things that they're supposed to. So Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. This is speaking of Jesus. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus had to learn obedience. Teachers were once students. They had to learn obedience. And they need to remember that obedience as they teach their students. But notice also verse 9, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. We only get that salvation from Christ and from God when we obey him. And so we need to remember that. This evening have that opportunity. If you are not a Christian, you can put Christ on in baptism through believing in him, repenting of your sins, and confessing your faith before man. And if you are a Christian and you've fallen away, you've forgotten that first love, you've left that first love, you can come back to him, repenting of your sins, or if you just need the prayers of this congregation, whatever your need may be, you can come as we stand and as we sing.
precious name we pray. Amen. 